Investment Series. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the introduction to that series, which is the future of workplace post COVID-19. Uh, so this series is going to be found on our Coronavirus Resource Center, along with a full slide deck of the presentation. And before I hand it over to Dean Stanbury, who will be moderating today's session, I want to go over a couple of housekeeping items. So everybody has been muted for audio quality purposes. And also, we'll have an extended uh, Q&A towards the end of the session. So please submit your questions in the go to panel. All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the IFMA webinar, Future of Work Post-COVID-19 Delphi Survey. The idea behind this webinar series is to focus on some of the research IFMA has commissioned and bring you closer to the experts by sharing their insights and conclusions. My name is Dean Stanberry. I'm IFMA's second vice chair of the Global Board of Directors, and I also chair IFMA's Environmental Stewardship, Utilities, and Sustainability Community. That's a mouthful every time. Uh, this is the second of two webinars. There was another one earlier today, which was hosted for our uh, European uh, contingent. And we'll focus on presenting uh, and discussing the findings and conclusions from this recent uh, Future of Work post-COVID-19 study, uh, which places uh, took place over the summer earlier this year. To the best of our knowledge, this is the first survey of its kind within the FM industry, and will also be the first survey using subject matter expert input uh, dealing with the consequences from global uh, COVID-19 pandemic that we're still battling in an unprecedented scale. The full survey report will be available September 28th, but in this webinar, we will share some of the insights and preliminary findings. The slides will be available to all who signed up, uh, and this session will be recorded and available tomorrow via YouTube and the IFMA uh, website. Over the next 60 minutes, um, you know, we will uh, introduce the, the panel and the Delphi survey methodology. Uh, Jeff Saunders will actually present an overview of the survey, and the panel discussion will focus on some of the conclusions and take questions from the audience. The full report actually covers six key themes, but for today's discussion, we will focus on primarily the workplace strategy conclusions. The rest of the themes will be covered in later webinars. Uh, workplace strategy is defined as a blueprint that sets out how to get the most from your uh, people, technology, and places tightly tuned to your business objectives, desired behaviors, and culture. Again, please uh, remember to use the chat box uh, on the left of your screen to uh, pose questions um, and, uh, and a comment. We also want to thank our sponsors for this, which is JLL and EPOS, and then a special thanks to the six uh, communities of practice for IFMA, which is the Real Estate and Advisory Leadership, Operations, Maintenance, Health and Safety, Environmental Stewardship, Utilities and Sustainability, uh, the technology community, the business community, and last but not least, the workplace evolutionaries. So let's move on to some of the introductions. Um, so we have uh, Jeff Scott Saunders, uh, executive advisor and futurist. He is the CEO of Nordic Foresight and is the IPMA Workplace Evolutionaries Denmark Hub co-leader. Uh, Jeff is a U.S. citizen, uh, has been based in Copenhagen, Denmark for a number of years. Previously, Jeff was Director and Head of Strategy and Innovation Team at the Copenhagen Institute for Future Studies and has been a National Security Consultant in the United States. Jeffrey specializes in applying futures research methodologies, including scenario development and behavioral science to solve challenges for large organizations, both public and private. Next up, uh, we have the incomparable Kate North. Vice President of Workplace Advisory at Colliers and founder and chair of IFMA's Workplace Evolutionaries Community. For over 25 years, Kate has helped organizations create innovative workplace strategies and adopt new ways of working. Since COVID-19, she is leveraging her extensive background in distributed work to help clients develop hybrid workplace models. Kate has authored over 40 workplace case studies and articles. In conjunction with the IFMA Foundation, she has co-authored two books, The Work on the Move, first and second editions, uh, which explores how social leadership and technology innovations are transforming the workplace and in the digital economy. Kate may work globally, but she calls Park City, Utah home. 
And then we have uh, Ted Ritter. Ted is a principal at LMI 360, which serves Fortune 500 companies to optimize engagement and brand recognition while accelerating actionable market opportunities. He's also the founder and principal at Draw Alert, a leading construction administrative software company. And Ted has a long history as a volunteer leader in IFMA, including uh, chairing the IT community. Ted was awarded its highest honor, the IFMA Fellow designation in the 2019 class of fellows. As a resident of Phoenix, Arizona, Ted is also an active member of the Phoenix chapter. So let's talk about the, the survey a little bit. Uh, back in March, April, when we were all in lockdown and beginning to discuss how transformative the COVID-19 pandemic uh, could potentially become, Jeff and Peter Ankersterney, IFMA's uh, global chair, uh, started discussing if the real-time Delphi approach could be in, uh, of interest to, for IFMA and especially the WE community to better understand consequences of the pandemic for the uh, FM and workplace community. In May, the IFMA's uh, board's uh, executive committee decided to elevate it uh, to include all IFMA communities and to be carried uh, out over the summer as soon as possible, as this was something that would be of interest to all members across the world and across communities, chapters, and councils. Councils. So the, the challenges that we're looking at is how will COVID-19 shape our future our collective future and the crisis in a post-crisis normal. Uh, what will the future of work look like post-pandemic? How will organizations have to develop and challenge their workplace strategies accordingly? Uh, we chose the real-time Delphi approach in order to obtain a spectrum of diverse external expert perspectives for key questions and assumptions to develop an objective consensus view uh, for the future in a highly uncertain time. It is a method uh, designed for strategic foresight when quantitative forecasting methods fail. Via an online platform, the real-time Delphi uh, facilitates dialogue between geographically separated experts to identify consensus views, divergent opinions. And when participants log in, they will they see their all their quantitative and qualitative answers from previous sessions. They can change their answers as desired uh, within a given period of time. The Delphi approach gives us curated views of the industry's leading subject matter experts on key challenges. It aids in decision making, enabling us to uh, orient on potential opportunities and risks using expert assessments. It identifies those consensus views and explores the dissenting opinions. Last but not least, let's talk at, at uh, who participated. So through IFMA's six communities of practice, we identified and invited 660 subject matter experts from across the globe. 248 logged in and answered parts of the survey. 150 completed the survey end to end. We had 837 visits and revisits. That's an average of three per subject matter expert. And we had 2,494 comments in total and 1,486 revisions and changes were made. So uh, there was a lot of participation, engagement, and, uh, uh, and really thoughtful dialogue between the participants. So at that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff and Nordic Foresight, who's been managing the survey uh, from its original design and implementation. So let's get a glimpse of what key findings and conclusions we have. All right, Dean, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I guess it's truly been an honor to actually have participated and designed and worked with the communities of excellence and the communities of practice to actually develop the survey, to invite the SMEs, and then to facilitate the dialogue and then the analysis on all the findings. When we ran the, the, the debate from um, across July, so right before the 4th of July holiday, through uh, the beginning of August. And through that, we had, as you were saying, a significant amount of participation. So we had over 100 comments per question. If you, you know, printed them all out and read them, it'd take about two to three hours per question to read through all the comments that um, were provided. So the 2,500 comments and the uh, 25 questions, you're looking at a good 50 hours of reading ahead of you <laughs> to, to go through them all. So it's quite a lot of really interesting findings and a lot of good debate to go through. And if we look at 
the uh, participants and who are the, some of these subject matter experts and what they saw and how they interacted. And so you can get an understanding of how the debate occurred. What we see is um, first a platform view. And right now, can I get next slide, Chris? Because I'm having a lag on the page turn. So on the respondent view, what we have is you know a question, of course, as a quantitative survey goes, you provide your answer, strongly agree, strongly disagree. Oh, this is going all haywire. So you have, going back one more, stop. You have the opportunity to agree, and then you have to provide your reason why. So you understand why is it you argue there, that you have this opinion that you have. And then the subject matter expert gets the opportunity for instantaneous feedback to see how their answer responds to the rest of the community of experts. And so then they could read in and say, okay, well, this person strongly agreed, I agreed, or maybe they strongly disagreed with me. And why did they do so? And then they could assess their answer up against what others say, and they could change that answer based on the feedback they're getting. Now, this is important to say it was anonymous. So we're not interested in who said it. Um, we're interested in the idea itself and how powerful that idea is to change person's opinions or not. And so this is the power of the Delphi uh, analysis this is because it's the ideas that matter, not who said it that matters. Now, when we went through and we you know, invited several persons to participate into the platform, uh, Chris, next slide, please. So when we participated, we have this question about what is consensus and how is it derived? And so consensus is a measure of where the majority of the views lied um, or fell upon. So you have a question of, yeah. So consensus is where the majority of views lie. So you have this assessment where it's measured by either a coefficient of variation uh, based upon a Likert score scale. And if it's a non-like Likert score, then it's an assessment of the various um, uh, majority opinions lied. And it has to be a majority that's beyond just a 55% uh, agreement or majority. We want a super majority. So we want something that's be above that, not a Brexit majority where you have around 50% of the respondents who provided their answers for it. Now, when we get into the participant demography, what we have here is we have a focus on subject matter experts. So it skews a little bit older than what you typically have in a, in a lot of surveys because they're typically people with 10 to 15 years of, of expertise in the field. Um, we had a little bit of a gender skew towards males, um, but there's a still a significant um, portion of women who participated into it. And we also had a broad geographic distribution. So 57% of the survey group was from the United States and North America, um, but the rest were from um, Europe and from um, uh, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Um, if we click the next slide, we go into the discussion about where is it that the fields of practice that they came from. A diverse range of both researchers, consultants, internal service support, external support functions, and others, but then also from across disciplines and workplace strategy, architecture design, business management, change management. There was a human resource participant, but there was only one, and that's something that we have to work upon as industry to get more mm. uh, participation from non-HR relevant, uh, or from HR relevant um, um, participants. Great deal of participation from facility management, real estate, technology, sustainability, well-being. So we're bringing together a very diverse group of subject matter experts because they're the ones shaping, working with clients to develop the post-COVID-19 world. And this is the aspect that we're looking at. How are they shaping the future of work within their organizations and for their clients? And then that way we can garner a good assessment of what's going on. Now, with that said, let's get into the thematic sections and the key findings, key points of this survey and what were some of the findings. Now, as Dean said, the, subject, the uh, survey went across six thematic subjects, workplace strategy, employee well-being and benefits, technology development, organization and productivity, sustainable development goals and facilities in demand. 
So in these areas, we were able to pull across a cross-cutting holistic analysis, bringing in the attributes that are of interest to the communities of practice across IFMA, and that are really shaping the discussions around what is the work, nature of work post-COVID-19. If we look at the focus area today, what we're gonna be focusing upon is five areas, and these are the key findings. One is the aspect of remote work, and 81% expect that 26% or more um, will work more than half of their time remotely. Um, there's a focus on people at office. Um, why will people come in? If so many people are able to work from home and from across spaces, why will they want to come to the office? Well, findings say it's the need of social interactions and, of course, the work requirements required to do so. That being said as well, there's other reasons for people to come in it's because they're facing well-being challenges. There's issues of stress, the pressure is rising, the economic downturn is starting to bite, and people are concerned about, you know, how do they you know, keep their jobs going and be productive and have their companies survive and thrive. There's, of course, concerns about um, infectious disease and insecurity, but the biggest, one of the bigger factors is um, the concern over isolation. And in July, we were already talking about the challenges of isolation, which is now becoming a hot item um, in the discussions around uh, the future of work. Then we have this aspect around workplace strategy. What do we do about it? Who's in control and responsible for it? And what does that mean? And the aspects around who is responsible for it um, and what is FM's role in this whole discussion. So these are the five thematic areas, which is just one of the chapters in the Delphi. There's many other chapters to, to take hold of and to develop. Now, why do people come, or how many people are working from home? We had a great deal of discussion. Chris, could you get me back up two slides, please? Because the system is hot. So why is it that people are coming to the office? Well, when we asked this question, we were looking for this aspect around consensus. And consensus, we had to get more than 55% who selected this option. We didn't reach that. But however, if you look at the majority across it, 81% were saying, hey, at least 26% of the workers will work remotely post-COVID-19. Um, and then the question is, well, why did they say that? What's the arguments for this? And if we start looking at the arguments, um, next slide, please. Um, they were started talking about those who said 26 to 50%. We will see more people working remotely, um, but they still start saying people are going to be working one to two days a week. Therefore, the, all, the overall percentage of the workforce working remotely will be more than half. It will still be limited. Um, same kind of arguments where those were saying it's about, going to be about 11 to 25 percent. Most people, when it comes down to it, they want the social interaction with their colleagues. They don't have the right equipment at home. Maybe they don't have the right physical setting at home. And so they ideally want to work one to two days a week at home and the rest of the time at the office. So these are some of the factors that are coming in. Now we get into that discussion, next slide, please, about why people do come to the office and what are the planning and discussions that we'll be having here. Again, the aspects around um, why do people come to the office, it's about the ability to collaborate with others, that social, professional interaction that helps them perform and grow. Can we get next slide, Chris? Yes, fantastic. Um, so that's need to interact with peers and colleagues that they can't fulfill online. The other aspect is they need to work with the equipment that doesn't um, that they can't get at home. And third, they need to address complex interactions, high value. What we're having right now, I wish I was actually there present with you presenting so I could see your faces, not talking to my dog, who is a great audience, but is not giving the feedback that I'd love to see. <laughs> so these are some of those aspects that people need to have um, in, in the ways of working in the online. Uh, ways of doing things while helpful don't fully supplement that so if we get chris next slide please we get this conversation about why is it of course when we start presenting these uh findings these are just exemplifying quotes there's lots of quotes behind it so this need for social interactions in person teaming mentoring that drives a reason why people are coming back to the office that need for equipment 
there's many people who just don't work with a laptop. They work with all sorts of other devices. And so you had you know, SMEs talking about people working in labs and development and all these things asking, what are they doing? How are they being productive? If they need access to unique equipment, many of them don't have access to this at home. So this is a challenge. People come, need to come to the office for these reasons. Next slide, please. And they need to address very complex interactions. Um, and like we we're talking about, it's, uh, it's this high level interaction, which is key. And then that final aspect, which is one of the things I saw when I was reviewing the comments that was an issue, was this aspect around um, not only the fact that people don't have the physical infrastructure to work from home, let's say if you live in a major city like New York or London or in Hong Kong or Singapore, we have very cramped uh, apartments. Um, we also have the aspect of the digital divide, which is actually quite important in uh, the United States, parts of Europe, and, and particularly in Australia. Um, one of the SMEs uh, works in Vermont, and he was saying 25% of the households don't have access to broadband, so they can neither do um, they can do education and they can't do work from home. So this is a challenge that's actually being accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis. In addition to that, now that we're at six months in, we're having this distributed workforce and we're gonna have new health and well-being challenges. And this is something that's becoming more and more important. What is it that's driving it? Of course, there's stress and mental health issues. And that was the number one view of, of the subject matter experts, but also the consensus view was that social and professional isolation. And oftentimes these weave together. And if you're looking at a number of studies, Working from home is great. It can help you be very focused and productive, but it's also the most socially isolating place to be. And if you go to many urban markets around the world, particularly in Europe and North America, the majority of urban dwellers are actually singles and the workplace is their most important social network. And we have to remember that it's a good portion of their mental well-being to have actual connections to that and the water cooler talks and everything like that. And then we had this, of course, concern over infectious diseases. That wasn't a consensus view, but it was a, actually a high view. And then the last aspect around in, in economic insecurity. So the stress and mental health issues, um, a study came out just today from Amazon that's showing that half of Americans are underemployed right now. So people are stressed about um, the ability to actually work and deliver value. And so they feel the need to work and they have trouble managing their work life and working um, too many hours. The isolation aspect, um, already identified in July, even a bigger problem moving forward as people are actually extending lockdown periods for longer and longer periods of time. Next slide, Chris. Mm -hmm. And then also this factor around, um, particularly that insecurity. One example from one of our um, SMEs in South Africa, you know, the situation is dire. The company, the country is under a lot of stress. Um, COVID-19 just added to that. And, and they're worried about salary cuts, burnouts, things like this. These are all these challenges that we as facility managers and workplace specialists yeah. need to address. Next slide, please. So what does this all mean? And so this comes into this topic of today's conversation, workplace strategy. And as Dean was saying before, workplace strategy is the intentional strategic alignment of the workplace, the business goals, vision, culture, and org of the organization. It requires an integrated multidisciplinary approach. And that links into workplace management, which is an emerging field, which is kind of bringing these elements together, bringing the teams together to actually begin to execute on a workplace strategy. And if you're interested in that, if my actually has a workplace management program through WE, and you can find out more about it on the WE uh, network code, we.ifma.org, if you want to learn more about it. But these are some of the aspects that actually come into play. But it's really interesting to see how this emerging field is interpreted from the SME panel and what they actually thought. Next slide, please. So workplace strategy, who sets it? This integrated approach to a distributed workforce, and what does it actually mean? And what does the workplace role mean in it? Um, who should lead that? Now, a quite interesting finding came out from this facility, from Broad Spectrum, a workplace specialist, and they said HR was leading it, which leads us to ask, is HR 
aware of that, that, that there's an expectation they should lead it? And two, are they actually able to do so in the right way? Mm -hmm. um, then he had, of course, this discussion about, hey, workplace strategy is supposed to be able to help an organization execute upon its strategy. So many of the subject matter experts were saying, we have to deliver from that point um, and understand what that is, and they should be leading it. And of course, HR has a role in developing it, but they actually be the ones guiding it. Now, previous to the COVID-19 discussion, that was something that was often talked about, but was also oftentimes really difficult to get awareness around the CEO table. Now, all CEOs have this or should have this as one of their priorities about how do they organize their workplace. Then, of course, you know, workplace management come in. That, that was quite important, but facility management lagged behind. And so the question is, what is the role for the facility manager in shaping these discussions? Where is their seat at the table? Who's going to be driving? So for the ones who said HR, they were talking about HR is responsible for the workforce. Um, and they were responsible for many of these aspects around how um, people should work, communicate, and collaborate. So they should be the ones that do it. Others were saying, hey, I believe this is corporate leadership. The CEOs, they must buy into the workplace strategy and lead the company in adopting it, whatever they may be. Um, and so these are those aspects that come in. Next slide, please. And it also comes into this discussion around who, um, what about the workplace management teams? And they're saying that we're going to see a change and an evolution and maybe a revolution in, in the functions, including FM, where you see a new profession emerging that, and a new team form that emerges that links together these various um, support functions into an integrated whole. So that may be the new aspect that's developing and emerging. And the core role is, okay, well, how do these teams, how are they brought together? Who should leave it? Who should lead it and who should be uh, kind of coordinating those tools together? It doesn't necessarily have to be someone from an HR function. They're worried about the policies and all the other performance metrics and things they have to do to ensure the running of an organization. Maybe they just don't have the bandwidth to take this task on. Um, and that leads to that facility management discussion. You have some who say, hey, we understand the place is best. We understand what people are doing. And in my opinion, we should be the ones kind of organizing this, cooperating, of course, with HR and IT and others to make this work. And that's this question. What do we need to do as an industry and as an organization to actually upskill, reskill um, FM professionals to participate in this discussion? One of the findings that came up again and again. So this leads directly into the responsibilities for the facility managers post COVID-19. Um, of course, you know, if you're going to be taking on a more integrated workplace strategy approach, you need to have a deeper alignment with the other support functions to actually provide an integrated solution. Um, you're going to need to focus, of course, on making a, a more healthy building in places like that for people to want to come to work together. They have to feel safe. And then there's an aspect about who's executing on that workplace experience and how do we actually define the workplace? Are we limiting it only to the bricks and mortars that the company owns themselves? Or is it across a range of workplace settings where we start going in and start taking an advisory function? These are some of these questions that become more and more pertinent as we look through and tease out the details of the Delphi study. So there's, you know, as a subject matter expert said, there always should be greater alignment. There already should be greater alignment um, than there is. Um, and it's a necessity post COVID-19. And again, that links into this discussion that we're having before about workplace strategy. What does that actually mean? So are we having the right conversations within the organizations around workplace strategy and what should we be doing? Um, and again, healthy buildings. We have to be able to prove that people can work efficiently from the organization. If we're saying people want to work one to two days a week from the office, uh, from home, rest of the time at the office, how do we ensure it's a healthy, productive place to encourage people to want to come back as quickly and as efficiently as possible? Next slide, Chris. And then, of course, if we start talking about that workplace experience, we have to talk about who executes on it. And this is an aspect where um, the subject matter experts are started talking about, hey, we could have this opportunity to start creating this holistic strategy that in incorporates many of these aspects but it requires a collaboration um, to maintain a strategy that works across all physical spaces, including into the home. Um, and again, 
that comes into this aspect around deploying the workplace strategy. Next slide, please. So this is a kind of summary of the whirlwind trip through the five factors or, or key points from the workplace strategy section. Uh, there's still many more questions that we didn't touch upon within that chapter, and there's many more um, discussions that we could have in the other um, thematic sections as well. So remember, we expect a great deal more of remote working, at least 26% of uh, workers moving forward. People will still want to come to the office, one, because they need the social interactions and all the team building and culture building, everything that was that developed from it. Um, there's a great deal of work requirements, and then it's there's a lot of factors that we need to be tackled around well-being. It's not going away. Um, if we think about the last six months, people have been working from home in less than ideal uh, conditions, and it's starting to show. Studies are showing 70% of us are having back problems, shoulder problems, headaches, um, fatigue, all sorts of issues that need to be dealt with. Um, workplace strategies is the, the method, method and discussion tool for setting the priorities and how we can actually start delivering on organizational strategies using the workplace in a range of settings doing so. And we have to start having that discussion about what is the FM's role and responsibility to achieve all those angles. So on September 28th, we'll be launching the report. And on September 30th, we'll be doing another webinar and we're gonna be focusing on the other sections that weren't covered in this brief presentation and these are, of course, a deeper dive into the employee well-being and benefits. Who pays for benefits for remote workers? Key question to define. What are the technologies that are shaping the future workplace? How are companies organizing to be more productive in a distributed workplace environment? What does this all mean for sustainability and environmental goals that we're setting for more efficient buildings? And what type of facilities will be in demand? These are all the topics that we went through and have great insights on. And I look forward to sharing those, more of those with you on the 30th of September. Thanks so much. And Dean, thank you for having me. And JLL and EPOS, thank you for the sponsorship. And it's been a wonderful time. I look forward to discussing some of the findings with you all. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, very interesting insights. And I'm sure for many people, it, it poses more questions than it answers. Uh, and part of our uh, reason for you know, undertaking this effort is that uh, we saw a lot of activity around the initial return to the office, uh, but it, there obviously were more questions that were going to be raised about what does it really mean beyond just getting people to get back into the workplace in a, in a healthy way. So now that we're, uh, we're going to move on to the panel discussion, and Jeff will re remain and be one of our panelists as well. Uh, so I'd like to start off with Kate, uh, since you were one of the first people who got introduced to the idea of the Delphi method, uh, and at the time you were very supported. So having been through the process now, what do you think of the Delphi method? Uh, it was fantastic. What a great opportunity. Uh, first of all, I just got to thank IFMA uh, for supporting all of the communities coming together and creating a very integrated, holistic approach. And Delphi, with Jeff's expertise, was the perfect platform. So as a community, we all had to go through our little black books, to identify who are the experts that we know throughout the globe so that we could put forward you know, experts that we knew that would really be able to represent not only the current state, but also the future state. So I think number one, it was great in the sense that it was global and it was very diverse. I personally, as a participant, loved the fact that, you know, you take the survey, but then you can go in and see how your response compares to your, your peers and to be able to kind of really vet through, you know, your personal thinking because clearly that when you're starting to look at somebody else's thoughts coming from you know, another country or from a different experience, it opens you up. And it made, I think it made all of us think differently about our responses and some, as Jeff pointed out, some changed it and some kept them. But it was a very good process. I, I don't envy Jeff of going through over 2,000 comments and trying to really um, <laughs> aggregate that data. I cannot wait to see the final report. It's gonna be fantastic. Great process. Thank you, Kate. 
Um, so, Ted, what was your experience in participating in the real-time Delphi study? I think it's the second uh, time I've used the platform, and really night and day. Uh, I think, uh, you know, going through, you know, uh, initially and then going back and doing some revisions on the comments, and then uh, unexpectedly actually having some offline uh, discussion with people saying, well, what did you think about that? And then finding out that we both went back in uh, and answered and revised questions yet again, uh, our answers. Uh, I thought it was very collaborative. I think, uh, as you know, Kate said, the, the global nature uh, really, I think it's given us some insights that we would not have had uh, otherwise. And again, uh, Jeff, hats off to you uh, going through all this data and producing this work. It's awesome. All right, thanks. Um, so this will be directed to both Kate and Ted, and we'll start with Kate. Uh, what do you think uh, was the most interesting insight uh, from the key findings presented so far, and were there any surprises? Uh, good question. I think that it was all very confirming. Uh, that was, I think, my overall perspective is that it took a number of different uh, surveys that I personally have been involved with, as well as conversations and dialogues within WE, and confirmed uh, some of these assumptions around well-being. Uh, but the part that was most surprising to me was that uh, we had very little attendance uh, from HRM in the participation of the survey. So the majority came from the FM world, and the majority of the FM said that it would be HR that will be leading workplace strategy. So um, I think that that's interesting. I've, I've been working with a number of HR experts and CHROs. Uh, they're a little bit of deer in headlights right now. Um, you know, the reason I believe while they were designated to lead the strategy is because of this huge component of the work from home or what we're calling distributed work. And, you know, they have been responsible for the policy and, and certainly are also representing well-being. They've got a deep focus around engagement. So it does make sense. The problem is, is that in the past, we just really haven't created a model that allows HR, real estate, and IT to come together. And, uh, you know, we've talked about it certainly in a number of, of we situations where we've, you know, really looked at the chief experience officer is a potential model and i think that's why the workplace management framework came about is how do we actually help encourage organizations perhaps for better alignment or restructuring so that they could uh, the hr it real estate communications could all be in one group shared budgets shared metrics i mean it's like nirvana uh, so that's the one <laughs> that for me has really got me going Ted? Yeah, um, so to kind of follow on with what Kate was saying, yeah, uh, the concentration of FM as far as SME participation, but I saw that metric on HR being, oh, they're the ones that can do all this. And it was like, what? It just did not resonate at all as being reality. Uh, I think uh, in terms of the collaboration and looking at uh, you know, outside of the traditional uh, corporate campus management strategy or high-rise top uh, management is, you know, I think we can learn a lot from the hospitality industry because the approach is very different in terms of everything is focused on customer uh, experience. Um, there is not, uh, you know, in, in most uh, organizations I've worked with over the last uh, couple of decades, there's not the same silence. There just isn't, you know, it's, it's one mission. Uh, and although it may not be a traditional office, uh, you know, if you think about the similarities are certainly there. I mean, you've got the hard and soft side, you've got, uh, you know, the requirement for, um, you know, good maintenance practices, you've got something about temporary culture. You know, you're staying in a hotel and it's a delightful experience for two or three days or, it really isn't. And I would say, you know, more often than not, those of us that uh, used to travel quite a bit, you know, kind of got used to uh, going from point A to point B to point C, uh, but having some consistency uh, with the expected experience and outcome. So I think we can look, you know, hard at what we can take from the hospitality industry uh, specifically, because it, it, it's whether, you know, 
uh, standardized properties or the you know mega resorts from Vegas, the alignment is much tighter. You know, and that's one aim is to you know have a great experience and want you to come back. So I mean, I think that there's some stuff there we need to look at. Thanks, Ted. Um, I want to just kind of point this back to to Jeff for a second. Uh, you know, having gone through these findings in detail. Uh, and you do this, uh, you know, for a living. Uh, were there any surprises that that you saw or can can point out from uh, from the findings you've seen so far? Um, yeah, it's more the aspect of of going through the 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 findings themselves and seeing where you know where the clusters lie and some where the blind spots um, lie as well. Um, and just also the regional differences, which you know I expected to to see, but how they unfolded um, um, in in the analysis themselves. So when we start talking about um, issues that will come up in the next webinar, um, we didn't see much regional difference in this chapter, but we saw a lot of regional differences in the subsequent chapters that we went through. Things about who's responsible for the remote worker. Um, and what are organizations' responsibilities towards them? Very different discussions in countries I thought that would have had a more, maybe more uh, social democratic uh, view of organizational responsibilities were actually the more hard about saying it's people's own responsibility, they take care of it themselves. So some of those uh, findings were, were quite interesting. There's a lot of, you know, um, kind of discussion around um, this aspect of a little bit, you know, like the not I or kicking somebody else in front of the uh, front of the bus and to take the challenge. And that was that question about who takes the lead and then what's FM's role in it. So there's a lot of tension in those questions around, you know, saying, oh, we think HR should take the responsibility for the strategy, though we want to be responsible for the total experience across workplace settings, including in the home. And that was one of the other findings that comes uh, later in the chapter. And that's Something's got to give there. There's a lot of things that need to be flushed out about who, who actually is in the lead, who's setting the agendas, um, how is that being coordinated, what are the skills that are required. Some of those questions need to be answered. And I found those quite fascinating to see those tensions and, and be very interested to discuss with, with you all about how to unfold them and unpack them and what they actually mean. So we're, what is an objective too far? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Ted, uh, going back to that, what, what do you think the biggest challenge will be for facility managers uh, kind of post COVID-19? Biggest challenge, uh, I think, you know, the, everyone's gonna be faced with how do we balance, you know, safe and productive. I think uh, communication is gonna be key. I think those that have not uh, formless alliances with HR, with IT, uh, are going to be most challenged. I think uh, we don't want to over-survey, but I'm going to go back to the hospitality piece. We need to think really hard how we're going to treat people, uh, especially since, uh, you know, the trends all point to, um, you know, split shifts or a lot more hoteling and, you know, Dean, you're going to be in that space, you know, on Tuesday and Thursday, and I'm going to be there Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And how do we manage all that? Um, I mean, the, the nuts and bolts of managing it, you know, those can be worked out, but how do we communicate? How do we make people feel um, good? And it, just, it, it sounds really simple, but it's not easy to answer that, uh, especially with, you know, a diverse portfolio uh, where it's, it's mixed between how do I get people in and out of a building that has 50 floors? Uh, if we're going to, you know, keep any kind of uh, distancing in mind, you know, do I have to, uh, you know, say start people at six and they go through eleven o'clock? Uh, you know, there's interesting challenges there. Uh, looking at where's my stuff? Uh, I mean, we we're all creatures of habit. We, you know, where's my stuff? Uh, we, you know, we've all got shashis on our desk at home, but you know, what happens when we go back and forth? You know, I mean, how does that work? Um, so this isn't, is, isn't that the book, Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's a good point, though, because right. it is so much about the change management piece. I mean, I think that is mm -hmm. a skill that we dance around a lot, but I think it's high time that the FM really owns change management, has a deep appreciation. Mm -hmm. uh, in talking to an organizational design 
person consultant yesterday, he said that COVID has even changed the way we think traditionally about change management. And so there's different models and different frameworks that, especially now where there's so much ambiguity and people want more clarity. They want to know where their cheese is. They can't control the virus, mm -hmm. the economy, the politics, their kids going to school, you know, the social unrest the things that we can help stabilize um, and make them feel like they have got a place to come to work, even if it's um, their home office, you know, how, what types of things can you bring in so that psychologically there's a feeling of safety? Yeah, yeah there's an aspect right. around that. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, there's this aspect around managing people's cognitive bandwidth. There's only so much you can mm -hmm. deal with uh, of change and different things. and so. The things that, you know, as Kate's saying, that bring some stability to things is, is things that actually helps people a lot during these times, avoids that stress and burnout. And then also some of those aspects about, you know, how do you structure your life for a digital um, work from home environment? It's very hard to, you know, create routines in the day and aspects around that. Who, you know, how you kind of avoid all the, the long term aches and pains of working from home for an ongoing uh, basis. We're seeing a lot of studies coming out now. This is a big, big problem that, that's lurking. And so how do we provide that advice? Of course, with the understanding that people are, are adults and they can figure out um, what's best for them, but providing that support to ensure that they're actually um, taking care of themselves for the long haul. Yeah, and avoiding that, I think it's called the deer in the headlight syndrome. <laughs> 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 Just all of a sudden freeze up. Uh, Kate, so in the Delphi, uh, respondents point to HR as the lead in developing a workplace strategy while FM owns the workplace experience. How would you see that working in reality both now and in the future? Mm. Well, um, as I mentioned before, I think if organizations create a better infrastructure and organizational framework that allows them to come together more holistically, uh, we have started to see a trend of more uh, real estate and facility managers starting to report into HR, so that may be naturally happening. I also deeply believe that if FMs can take the workplace management program and start to really understand how to lead strategy, how to develop that strategy, and at a minimum be a part of that, um, I think that's going to be a really important part because that's where you have a voice into what the actual strategy is going to be not just um, operating it in the future, but really being able to help share your expertise on how to make this happen. So I think there's going to be some upskilling that will come. And Ted, to your point, is that we have to be able to capture data. And so, uh, you know, un ensuring that you've got some great data analytics. Um, oftentimes, the, the way in which we measure the success of a strategy is based around human performance you know, engagement scores. Most organizations are doing those. They're tracking them very tightly right now. Um, that's an important metric to be able to have on the dashboard and understand what does that mean? So I think that it's going to require, you know, some groups maybe already doing that. It would be fun to have a panel of those that are already working in strong alignment and having them talk about their experience and how they got there. It is certainly not impossible. But I think, um, you know, taking those strides in starting that conversation is going to be critical. Um, I know within IFMA, we've had lots of discussions um, around SHRM and other associations wanting to bring them on board and, and do more collaboration. With the workplace evolutionaries, we've been heavily involved. Um, many of our hub leaders have engaged with Disrupt HR, and we're starting that conversation as well. So I think that it's going to be a process or a journey and uh, that we need to embark upon it now. So let me, uh, th this is, comes from one of our uh, participants here, our audience members, uh, Peter Isley. Um, and uh, this is a variation on this, this question. It says, one of the key findings uh, was proposing higher integration of HR, IT, and FM as a driver of corporate workplace initiatives, uh, a message that has been pretty consistent over many years. I'd be interested in the panelists' views on how this might be accomplished and operationalized in corporate environments. Uh, so, Ted, why don't we lead off with you in that one? 
operationalize. Okay, so you know, thinking about you know again uh, from the technology perspective, you know how do we how do we actually find out if something's working? What what uh, tools do we need to have in place to uh, facilitate the movement of uh, people and products? Uh, you know, throughout a workspace. Uh, you know, going back to you know, some basic fundamentals is, you know, we can't do space management, move management, booking reservations without knowing who's getting hired next week. We can't. Uh, so we have to talk. We have to talk. Uh, we need to be able to share that data. We also need to have a level of trust so to know that, unfortunately, there'll be some people leaving next week as well. You know, we have care custody control over that space and the experience, um, you know, from the parking lot to the restroom and to the workspace to uh, any other facet within a, a given facility. We can't do that in a vacuum. You know, we have to communicate. We have to have the data uh, and uh, the financial implications of having that data efficiently provided. Uh, can drive some really good returns for any given um, the corporation. Uh, what really got used? Uh, can we uh, add in another layer of comfort uh, so that we know that you know Jeff was in that desk on Tuesday and on Thursday someone reported uh, uh, an issue? Uh, can we do contact tracing? Yes, uh, if we have the data, if we have accurate data, can measure. That's great. It's Simple, uh, but complex at the same time. You know, in some organizations, work with rolling out very uh, robust and rich technology solutions. Uh, everybody rolls up their sleeves and it works. Uh, it worked pretty quickly. And in other organizations, those silos never really came down. There's the illusion they were there's really. So I don't know if that's a perfect. Answer: There is no perfect world, but it's it's realizing if we don't work together, um, the effectiveness uh, of our team and the effectiveness of our organizations is going to suffer tremendously. Kate, any um, postscript to that? Uh, well said. All I can say is leadership, 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 Peter. <laughs> you know, I think that's the thing that we need if we're really going to try to change these things and. Honestly, I think that so many leaders, because they finally do understand this whole work from home because they've had to do it, they've understood that their teams can be productive, they can be mobile, they're now understanding that they've got to really watch closely to engagement and well-being, especially that younger demographic of young males, 21 to 30. Um, those are the ones, Jeff, that I think are in the city, that are living by themselves, that have, they need the mentorship. They need the tribe. Um, they haven't, most likely, they're probably reporting to a manager that doesn't really feel comfortable in leading teams that they can't see. But it's, those leaders are starting to get a taste of it. And so I think proactively, if you can build a case and talk about how to form this integrated team within the organization would be a great step. Yeah, and I, I, I think uh, just building upon that is um, – how do you do it in a way that builds trust? Because it's easy to do with the, the technologies that Ted's talking about and misuse it. And we're seeing in the market explosion in bossware saying, I didn't trust my employees before. Um, now they're working from home. So I'm going to do logs of when they're logging in to work and how many emails they're sending out and who they're talking to, the, all that keystroke logging, all those aspects. So how do you do this in a, in a way that is trust building helps people to you know be better performing um without you know going into a more uh, big brother and you know negative way of, of managing people i think that that's some of those key challenges that we have to to think about doing it in a constructive way mm -hmm. i think we need a new symbol you know the circle with a line through it that says no bossware uh <laughs> <laughs> Ted, I'm going to come back to you uh, because we're, we're an FM organization, probably a lot of FMs on our audience, uh, to get a little more focused on that. Uh, one of the SMEs stated, many FMs are not fully utilizing the technology that is already there. So what is needed to overcome the FM's slow adoption of technology? So I, I think, you know, looking at, at an assessment of what processes are you managing, what uh, technology you have in place, what technologies you can connect to. There's some 
uh, resources on the it.isma.org website about how to conduct uh, an internal um, FM tech assessment. Uh, you know, you can't really move forward unless you know what you have and what the capabilities are. I think looking at uh, slow, I don't think I fully agree with that. I think it's more of uh, there was you know, limitation in budget uh, to really utilize all features of any given technology. And I think it really comes down to uh, do you have uh, the wherewithal? uh to really have uh the, the picture of what you have what you need and to build a business case so they, these are essential tools especially in these times uh, and be able to articulate that to uh the cfo or whoever you're reporting into to say we need to turn on this other module because we can do this this and this which will return the following um, in terms of benefit to the organization. So I think it's, it's a three part. I don't think it's necessarily all slow, but I think it's uh, a matter of, you know, not necessarily knowing what you have and how to fully deploy it and then how to articulate why you need some budget to, to you know, move forward. So I hope that answered the question. Okay. I know we're uh, right about at the, t the end of our hour. I have, uh, I'm going to ask one more audience question here. Um, and then we'll turn it back over to uh, Chris for the wrap-up. Uh, so from Kyle LeBlanc, uh, it says, what will work from home or work from anywhere look like? And will commercial real estate decline? Uh, so let me, let me toss that back to Kate and see what your thoughts are there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think what we're realizing, and it will be interesting to see over time what actually takes place, that um, you know, you have to be a good candidate for working from home. You've got to be able to be have the right type of environment. Uh, I think those that are um, that have children are having issues. There are some people that just prefer to have the separation of work from home. There's a number of, of complexities. So I think organizations today are really trying to understand um, post COVID, and that's hard to do because right now everybody says they want to continue to work from home because they're afraid of going into the office. So we'll have to get to that point when we have that layer taken care of and people feel safe. But I think what we've seen throughout all of the research I've seen is that people want choice. They want flexibility. So the work from home, what that offers is the ability to do heads down, to focus, you know, that type of work can oftentimes, again, with the right setup, be extremely productive. It can also, you know, save commutes. It can provide better work-life balance. You can eat from the fridge. If you are um, empowered and disciplined, you'll maybe exercise a little bit more. So there's some good things that people don't want to give up. But as what Jeff shared is that we miss each other. We miss our ability to connect and to be together and to stand shoulder to shoulder and celebrate and to walk in and feel that culture and have those informal, spontaneous conversations that are just so unique. So I think we're going to be able to continue, Kyle, to see a blend of both. And, and I would love to see a world in which the employees have the choice. And that is complex when you're thinking about how do I manage that level of spike of people that are coming in. And that's what we call capacity management. And that's when you work really closely with HR to understand who will be coming in. Will there be team days assigned? Will it be, you know, will there be dedicated desks for those people that can't work from home and hoteling or hot desking for others? So this hybrid model is really starting to emerge. That amount of space, you know, if you had uh, hot desking, you know, and you had a, a high number, perhaps you'd see a reduction in the real estate that's needed. But in my belief, um, the post-COVID world will still take over much of what we've learned through this experience. I don't think we'll ever go back to the level of density that we've seen before. I think that we're going to have higher levels of circulation patterns, and that purpose of place is going to be committed to team and collaboration spaces. So the shift of the number of workstations will probably decrease, and the increase in collaboration space can occur. And it will be different for every organization. You know, clearly one of the things that we've seen some organizations tap into is that they can also use a, a distributed or a remote strategy to hire talent outside of their, you know, their city and, and their immediate environment. So it allows them to recruit talent. They don't have the real estate costs that are associated with that. 
we're finding that there's pockets of talent that are you know geographically coming across so uh, it's a it's a process it's you know I think what we're going to see is um, as this begins to shake out as many organizations diving in deeply and seeing what it means to them okay and uh, I see Chris reappeared on the screen here so he's probably uh, trying to uh, virtually kick me under the table uh, <laughs> Yeah. Thanks. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, basically say thanks to our participants and uh, the questions. Uh, I do believe that we will take the questions we were not able to answer and get answers for them and, and post them uh, after the webinar. I want to give a big thanks to Jeff Saunders and the uh, Nordic Foresight for all the work they've done on this uh, survey and for your time today and to Kate and to Ted uh, for being a part of the panel discussion. Uh, Kate, for her persistence, she was up at oh dark 30 this morning to participate in the session in Europe and then on this one as well. So uh, you're a trooper. Mm -hmm. My pleasure. <laughs> and I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. <laughs> on, on behalf thank of you. thank you so much, everybody, for participating. And uh, most of all, huge thank you to the audience for all of your great questions and participating. Uh, before we go, um, we do have, as Dean and Jeff had mentioned, the full report will be available on September 28th. And then also we'll be back for episode two on September 30th. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and as I mentioned at the top, uh, we have the full recording for this session and we'll have the complete slide deck made available um, within a day or so on our Coronavirus Resource Center. So please go to ifma.org slash coronavirus for all of that. Uh, we'll see everybody back for episode two. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.